can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Arian Radman of Ignite Post. And Arian, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And uh, we were chatting, and since Ignite Post, you have to check it out. And you know, I geek out on direct response marketing, copywriting, and relationships. Those two things are really the foundation of how I've made relationships and built a business and everything else. And this is kind of the fundamental premise behind Ignite Post. This is what they do. So I'll explain a little bit about what they do. But some other episodes that kind of relate to this is uh, Brian Kurtz. Um, He's one of the top, you know, direct response leaders that I know. I consider him a friend and mentor. And uh, we did a couple episodes on the podcast on him. He helped up build up... uh, $150 $150 million company um, and in publishing and uh, direct response in newsletters. So check those episodes out. Um, I also had Paul Bingham on the podcast. And Paul um, has, I met him through Brian, actually, through one of his Titan events. Um, and he's the largest non-Jewish contributor to the state of Israel. He's raised over a billion dollars for the state of Israel um, through direct mail, actually. Um, and on the um, digital front, big Jason Henderson, one of the most experienced email marketers online. He's created just some of the email marketing strategy behind some of the biggest product launches and companies. So you can check that episode out as well and more on inspiredinsider.com. And we also fe- featured Devin Sizemore on the Top Business Leader Show. And um, Arin, you know Devin. How do you know Devin? I do. Yeah, yeah. So I got connected through a friend of a friend, but I joined his uh, his community and actually uh, have been going to the, the round tables. He has this community of kind of like-minded business uh, leaders who are all trying to support each other and hold each other accountable and kind of grow together. So uh, that's been really super effective. So uh, that that's how I know Devin. And then obviously he connected us. So uh, just kind of speak to the merit of his work. Big shout out, Devin. Thank you. Check out <laughs> Devin Sizemore and what he's doing. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability with you and all the full execution and production behind the scenes. Um, or we kind of call ourselves the magic elves that work behind the scenes to make the make it look easy for the host, push everything out everywhere, um, it, which we'll, we'll do for this episode as well. So if you've thought about podcasting, Definitely you should, you know, I, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to profile the people and companies I most admire and share what they're working on with the world. So check out Rise25 if you've thought about podcasting. We have lots of free resources too on inspiredinsider.com. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce um, Arian Radman. He's CEO of Ignite Post. And they're a service that helps brands create magic moments for their customers. And how do they do that? They use real pen and ink handwritten notes. You know, those things that come in the mail, you know, right? Like we're used to this digital world and there's nothing like a nice handwritten note to give that magic touch. And that's what they do. So at scale, uh, they've served brands like First Republic, SEM Rush which I've had um, uh, some of the people, Eugene on from SEOM Rush, check that episode out, Sotheby's and many, many more. Um, His background is actually in software engineering, and he spent the last 10 years building a number of businesses from the ground up. And prior to Ignite Post, um, Arian was co-founder and CTO at CoachUp. Um, I've actually used CoachUp before. All right. The funny thing is, and it's a nation's, one of the nation's (laughs) leading sports coaching companies with over 15,000 coaches nationwide, maybe more by now. Um, and NBA champion Stephen Curry, it was the lead spokesperson for that. So, Arian, thanks for joining me. Yeah, hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to to dive in and talk more. Yeah, talk a little bit. I want to get to how'd you get Stephen Curry as a, a spokesperson, <laughs> but we'll get to there. Talk a little bit about Ignite Post and what you do. Yeah, so I think you you hit the nail on the head there. So essentially, at Ignite Post, what we do is uh, our goal 
our mission is to help brands create magic moments for their customers using real pen and ink handwritten notes. But the way that we go about it is pretty unique. So we have uh, software that enables customers to kind of plug right into either their marketing automation software or CRM system to trigger very perfectly timed, you know, handwritten notes. And then on the hardware side, we actually have a fleet of handwriting robots that hold real thick ballpoint pens to give warmth to each note uh, so that we can operate at scale. And so this kind of combination of triggering something that is perfectly timed, that's very personalized, is really that kind of combination that we see that really drives results and drives people to action. I want to get a little granular and we will like CRM integration, you know, people are listening are a lot of times CEOs, founders, and we'll get into how it works with the CRM integration and how they can use it. But um, sure. it seems so random. How did you come up with this idea? Yeah. So really it's, it's kind of a result of the current environment that we live in, right? So we took a look at what's going on and right now we live in a digital age. We've never been inundated more with digital communication, right? Whether it's, digital ads, emails, uh, SMS, push notifications on literally every device that we own. So what we did at Ignite Post is we wanted to, we, we basically sat down and said to ourselves, you know, if I'm a brand and I'm really trying to build a big brand, what what is it that's going to separate my brand from anyone else? And really what it comes down to is the ability to build and maintain relationships and kind of establish that loyalty with your customers. That's how you build a big brand. Uh, but because of this kind of sea of noise that we, we see with digital communication, we said, if we're trying to project you know, a decade or so into the future, what is it? What, what kind of tools are brands going to really need to set themselves apart and develop that deeper relationship? And so as human beings, that's one thing that people always forget is human beings learn by interacting with their environment and touching things. And you know, we're, we're tactile beings. Uh, this whole digital age and digital world is very new to us if you look at the evolution of us as humans. And so uh, that's kind of really why we settled on, all right, well, what we really need to do to help brands build and establish deeper relationships with customers is enable them to actually send something tactile to folks. And then there is nothing kind of more personalized that we could we could think of that would uh, develop that relationship deeper than an actual penned note. Uh, and so when we were coming up with a solution, that's really why we decided to do exactly what we did and, you know, why we settled on, you know, it's not just mail and direct mail. We wanted specifically to have a nice penned, uh, pen and ink handwritten note uh, to kind of deepen that relationship and deepen that connection. And so that was kind of the genesis and the, the big idea um, that kind of fit into our mission of just helping brands create those deeper relationships and magic moments for their customers. Yeah. I mean, it seems obvious now after the fact, but um, back when you were first starting, right? Cause you've had two other companies. Can you take me back to that room? And I don't know who you were <laughs> ideating with and what were you thinking about then when you were just thinking of what's the next thing you're going to build? Yeah. Well, so I guess the most common thread for in my life has been this kind of thread of personalization. So even in my last business, right? So Coach Up, basically we were connecting uh, coaches and athletes for one-on-one -on -one training. And the reason why we did that, because our thesis was the way you actually get better is by one-on-one -on -one individualized training, right? And so the whole idea is how do we bring that at scale to, you know, to coaches and athletes everywhere? And so this is almost kind of an evolution of something like that, right? Where the whole idea is, all right, if I'm a brand and I want to build a big, big brand, how do I develop that one-on-one -on -one, you know, relationship and communication at scale? And so that's kind of the, the common thread that probably fed into the genesis of Ignite Post, but it's that whole idea of personalization that you know, focusing one-on-one -on -one and developing that back and forth uh, communication and that relationship and doing it on an ongoing basis over either you know, a training uh, you know, profile or kind of your lifetime of training or whether it's a customer journey there's a lot of dynamics that are very similar between the two uh, so i think that's kind of, that kind of fed into you know the genesis of the idea behind ignite post talk about the evolution of the of the service and company um where do you get started first you know because obviously we're talking about there's a lot of um, probably custom software. I mean, this is your expertise, but there's also a lot of hardware and robots too. So where did you first start 
um, when you were starting the company? Yeah. Well, so my background is in software. So that, that's where we started, right? So I, I always like to say we're, we're a software company at its core, and that's really the, the strength of, of everything. But uh, w- my spin on it is a little bit unique, even though my background is in software engineering. Everything that we've done has been designed to be very easy to use by someone that doesn't have a software background. <laughs> so, you know, when we talk and, you know, we can get into like the integrations and how everything works, you know, in a bit, but that's kind of really where we started. We said, all right, who's really going to be using this service and how are they going to operate? And what we found is for the most part, we're working with, you know, marketing professionals, sales professor- professionals, but folks that don't have a deep technical background. So that's actually where we started. And we said, the number one thing that we are going to need is the ability for someone to actually use this service that doesn't have a tech background. So we didn't want to make it, you know, highly technical so that you needed to, you know, understand, you know, how to use APIs and how to use, uh, how to integrate with, you know, various components. So that's kind of like the big key. And actually that's true to, to this day. So we always like to say, if you want to get up and running with Ignite Post, you can do so with no development, no developers required. Uh, it's very easy to use for a marketer to just take and plug into their existing systems uh, and and be off and running. So that's really where we started first. And then everything was kind of built around that thesis of how do we just make this super easy and how do we abstract away all of the heavy lifting and work? So we wanted it to be as easy as possible, number one. And then number two, to make it scalable, we wanted it to be something that folks could just plug in, kind of set up once and then kind of let it go and let the system kind of work for, for them. But then you need robots, right? Then we so need robots. talk exactly. about the robots <laughs> for a second. Yeah. So we have robots that hold real big ballpoint pens and will write out handwritten notes. Uh, so like I said, we did the software. We actually worked with a hardware manufacturer to, uh, to, to build that for us. So um, that was something that, you know, we grabbed and, you know, kind of uh, worked with them in order to, you know, fit our needs. Uh, and so essentially our, our goal was to uh, figure out what would give us the most human-like um, penmanship out there. And so we went to a bunch of different vendors, uh, you know, did a bunch of research to figure out you know, what kind of robotics are out there, uh, what kind of technology exists, and basically analyzed a, a bunch of them and then decided uh, to pick the manufacturer that, that we went with. And so on our side, what we do is, like I said, we, we've kind of built this nice software layer to almost go end to end. So from plugging into an existing um, CRM system or e-commerce platform, we made that super easy uh, to you know kind of create and set up automated flows. And then on our end, we actually built a lot of software internally to help our fulfillment and operations team fulfill everything in a um, efficient like manner. So there's a lot of kind of custom software that we built behind the scenes that is really designed to do all the heavy lifting for us, right? There's still a little bit of human work in there, but for the most part, we've tried to abstract as much of the human work out of it as, as we possibly can. There's a lot of logistics involved. So, totally. I mean, so much from the software <laughs> side to now we have physical products to then mailing out these physical products. Um so walk me through how it works. So a company, um, you know, I was looking at, let's just say True, okay, sure. energy drink. Um, I don't know if that's a good example, but where it plugs in, sure. and we could just walk through an example of it connects with this CRM, but there's other CRMs out there. And then what happens after that? Yeah, that, that's a great example. So the great example uh, in the e-commerce space, right? Super, super big space for us. Um, Really cool thing about e-commerce is that we're now at this point where we're trying to, you know, connect both the online and offline experience. And so that's kind of really what they used us for. And the whole idea was, you know, if I'm a brand and I just live online, how do I keep that customer journey going and get the experience of maybe having a physical retail store that somebody can actually ex- like have an experience at? without actually having that physical brick and mortar store. So with something like True, we basically set up some post-purchase uh, flows that was designed to store people along their customer journey. So as an example, when somebody made their first purchase, you know, if they, if they purchased a variety pack, that was an opportunity for uh, the, the brand to reach out to the uh, customer and one, check in to see how they're doing, but two, in e-commerce, 
everything these days lives and dies based on reviews, right? That's what everybody's trying to do. When I go to make a decision about a particular product that I want to use, what's the first thing you do is you go and you see what other people have said about it. So uh, that's kind of the first core thing that they that they did is they said, okay, I want to have uh, I want to build our reviews. So whenever somebody made a purchase, we would follow up with a nice handwritten note that looked something like this. Uh, I said, hey, thank you so much um, for your order. It would mean the world for our team if you could, you know, take two minutes and leave us a quick review. Uh, thanks so much. And it actually came from the founder. Uh, and so something like that was super impactful. We like to say, you know, injecting these moments of surprise and delight along the customer journey is really what drives people to action. So that's one example. Uh, that, that's kind of a, a fun example, the most common thing we see. The interesting thing is that there's a couple of different layers to that. And actually what we saw, particularly with this brand, is there, a, there were a couple examples of times where you know somebody made a purchase and then uh, you know th there was one situation where someone actually had the uh, incorrect uh, flavor shipped to them. So they purchased one flavor and they got the other flavor um, you know, sent to them. And so because of this note, and actually posted this in an email back to the founder, uh, instead of that being kind of like a negative situation of, hey, you didn't, you didn't ship me what I ordered, it actually turned into a positive situation because the response they got was something like, hey, by the way, I just want to let you know, I ordered you know, this flavor, you sent me the wrong one. By the way, I got your handwritten note. Thank you so much for reaching out to me. You know, I'm going to go and I'll leave you a review. And by the way, you know, can you just send me the, the correct flavor? So it, it kind of mitigated this, you know. It built that relationship and kind of yeah, softened it, a mistake, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's what a lot of people don't realize is, yes, everybody is like very, very zeroed in on, okay, well, how do we create, you know, ROI? How do we measure these things? But there's also the, the you know, intangible stuff like that, that really has a big impact that a lot of times people don't, you know, really associate. But I always like to bring that up because that, that's always kind of a good example to walk through. All right. And talk about the CRM. So, you know, obviously it's in a post-purchase. What, um, how does it integrate with someone's CRM from, from that standpoint? Yeah. So the good thing is from an integration standpoint, there's a number of different ways. And so, again, this kind of comes back to our philosophy, philosophy that we want to meet you wherever you are and whatever's easiest for you to use, that, that's what we'll do. So there's a bunch of ways that we can integrate. Um, if we talk about you know the e-commerce e space, you know we have uh, integrated apps on things like Shopify, so that if you're just on that platform, you can just one-click install our app, and you can set up flows and be up and running. So that's very easy. Um, but there's a number of different ways to to integrate with any CRM or marketing automation platform you use. And so some of those ways are obviously uh, we have an API that you can use, right? So that gives you the most control. Uh, if you want to just directly integrate with our API, uh, that's kind of option one. Uh, the second option is we, so we have the Zapier app, obviously, so that integrates with something like, you know, 3,000 other, you know, apps, depending on yeah. what CRM or anything you use. Yeah. So that's I've super had easy. Wade, uh, you could check out the interview I did with Wade, one of the founders oh, of nice. Zapier on the podcast too. Yeah. Yeah, and they get connected with anything pretty much. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So that's super easy. And then we actually have built a way that you can integrate with us simply by sending us an email. So basically any platform, any marketing automation tool that's capable of sending us an email, uh, you send it to our operator bot, operator at ignitepost.com. Uh, but you send us a, uh, a templated email with whatever information you want included in your handwritten note. And we take that, internalize it, digest it, and turn that into a handwritten note order for you. So normally, you know, between our integrations, our API, Zapier, or just that ability to just send us an email whenever you need a note triggered, there's typically a very easy way, depending on what system you're using or kind of what flow you want to set up uh, to, to get up and running. Um, you know, it sounds like there's almost like a direct integration with Shopify. Um, are there any other direct ones with CRMs that... Um... I mean, people can use Zapier and connect it to, uh, but is Shopify the most popular? Are there any other direct integrations? That's the most popular one. Um, yeah. Believe it or not, the most popular way that people typically integrate with us is through the email functionality that I mentioned. Uh, it, there's been many times where we've started going down the path of kind of like connecting our Zapier app and everything. And then they learn, they're like, oh, I can just, I can just send you an email when I, when I need this triggered. Like, forget everything else. Like, I don't even care. Like, 
I don't want to use like a native integration because that's just easier for me. So that's the uh, that's the honestly the the number one way that most folks uh, integrate with us. Let's talk about some use cases. I can see um, <clears throat> if you're if you're looking at the video right now, you can see we're at ignitepost.com and there's industries. E-commerce is a big one. Um, insurance, nonprofit, enterprise sales. Um, talk about the B2B space. How do people use it in the enterprise sp uh, sales space? Yeah. So enterprise sales, the most common thing we see is uh, prospecting, you know, reaching out to get your foot in the door, uh, especially for kind of higher ticket items or to get past gatekeepers. Uh, I always like to say, you know, I'll hold up an example, but they get a lot of stuff sent to them both digitally and physically. But, you know, when our notes come in the mail, they look something like this, right? So it's a very personalized handwritten note that shows up in a a seven, you know, five by seven envelope. So when that comes uh, to someone's desk, number one, if there's a gatekeeper, like a secretary or an admin, typically those are the things that don't just get tossed. At least you're going to get some eyeballs put on it. Well, so it's that's, handwritten. You know. And it's handwritten, right. right. So yeah, so that's the that's the number one thing is let's not get thrown out. Um, that's the most common thing we see in uh, the enterprise sales space is prospecting. But there's a lot of other opportunities, right? So the, the beautiful thing about the service is you can use it almost across the entire sales cycle. So prospecting for sure, getting your foot through the door to open the conversation. But then it also, you know, we also work with a lot of teams to help steward uh, deals through the, the pipeline. So, you know, if a particular deal is stalled or they haven't had communication with somebody in a while, sending them a handwritten note to kind of reinvigorate them, uh, that works really well. Uh, when they get to a later stage in the in the sales pipeline, so you know, uh, thinking about you know closing a deal or you know getting getting them over that hurdle, that's another area that we see people use the service a lot. Uh, and obviously, you know, whenever you sign up a new account, depending on you know how long you've been talking or who you're, you've been talking to, that's that's a very common flow that we see set up as well. So whenever something you know gets marked as closed one or you know uh, gets moved over the the finish line automatic kind of trigger set up to just reach out and just kind of start the relationship off on a, on the good foot. What are some, um, are in creative ways you've seen people use it? And I just want to point out, you know, they have a bunch of templates here, um, on ignite post and this is specifically in, in the, um, enterprise one. So they have, mm -hmm. you can see the different reasons, personalized note. You can see the congratulations note. There's thank you notes. There's a, a number of them. Um, I love to hear some creative ways. Um, and there's two episodes people could check out. Uh, Caleb O'Dowd and Sam Markowitz are both Gary Halbert protégés. And they talked about um, Gary Halbert when he was training, at least it was Caleb, to you know be a rock star direct response copywriter, made him handwrite all the envelopes. You know, No matter how many there were to send out, he had to handwrite <laughs> the addresses on the outside of the envelopes. Because like you said, if it doesn't get open, it doesn't matter what is on the inside. That outside, um, he was talking about being handwritten was so mission critical. And one of my favorite books is uh, Gary Halbert wrote The Boron Letters. I had his son Bond Halbert on. Um, and it talks all about this. So if you want to kind of geek out on some copywriting advice from some of the top people, you could check out the one with Sam Markowitz and Caleb O'Dowd, which is talking about similar stuff to that. Um, all right. But um, what, yeah. what ways of creative ways. I mean, there's the thank you notes, there's occasions, there's, um, you know, just after a follow up. Are there any other just off the wall ways you've seen people use this? Yeah, there's a couple like really cool things that I that I like. Um, so one, so we mentioned uh, birthday notes, right? So like sending somebody a, a happy birthday card. I really feel like it's a lost art, right? Certainly in business, you almost never get a, a card uh, in business, like for your birthday with our system, super easy to kind of set up and schedule those ahead of time. We actually have a lot of folks that will schedule it for the year for like all of their either, you know, VIP customers or their high value you know, contacts. So that's really cool. I, I like, I like that aspect. Um, but the other really cool thing that I like to see is everybody thinks about sending holiday cards, right. Around, around the holidays. I think one of the coolest things I've seen is to do the same thing and just reach out in the middle of like the summer, right? Like almost have that like holiday card, like, hey, just thinking about you, just checking in, or hey, just wanted to give you a quick update, but at a time where no one else is thinking of it, right? Everybody in December expects to get a bunch of these holiday cards from people, you know, kind of giving an update of what they've been to been up to over the year. But if you send it at a time where you're just 
totally unexpected. It's just that more impactful because you're not in a crowded mailbox with everybody else. And it really stands out. So kind of taking the same concept, but kind of s- slightly twisting it and just changing up the timing. Uh, that That's something that's really cool and, and very, very effective. I love it. One of my favorite uh, interviews was with um, John Rulin, who wrote uh, Giftology. Oh, and yeah. he talks yeah. about the exact same thing with don't be in a crowded mailbox, right? Yeah. You know, don't send it during when everyone else sends it. And that's exactly what you're talking about here. Um, and it's people are using innovative things also. Um, how do people use and integrate QR codes? And we're looking at here, yeah. I was just looking through um, Brio here, uh, does uses a QR code and integrates yeah. that. Yeah, that's really cool. And this is actually super popular kind of across the board. This particular uh, case is in the, in the e-com space, uh, there's a number of different ways you can do this. But again, it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, that everybody wants to you know, attribute how well things are doing, because obviously we want to tie this back to you know, ROI and impact and, and all those fun things. But there's a lot of different fun ways that you can use uh, something like Ignite Post and kind of combine it with a QR code. Um, and basically, it all comes down to the experience that you want to give someone. So keep in mind, one of the, one of the most innovative ways that I've seen people use this is when you get a five by seven, you know, kind of envelope that shows up, it looks like an invitation. It looks like you're getting an invitation to somewhere. So one of the really cool things is instead of positioning the QR code as like, hey, scan for this coupon or scan for this offer. uh, One of the ways that we see a lot of folks position it as, hey, we'd like to invite you to do thing X, right? Because it looks like an invitation. So inviting you to do something like, hey, I put together a curated collection for you of products that I think you would like based on, you know, your previous purchases or, Hey, you know, we have an offer just for some of our VIP users. Take a look at it. Um, those are some of the most innovative ways. I think in the example that you pulled up, one of the coolest things that we do is we work with a lot of folks that, um, a lot of brands that have subscriptions. So they run, uh, either they have a su- subscription as a portion of their business or that's their entire business, right? Is they have kind of like a subscription box. And one of the best use cases that we've seen is this ability to really extend how long people are in a subscription. And it typically, the flow goes something like, you know, you know, typically people are in a subscription with you for let's say six months. And then that's kind of the average churn point. So what we'll do is we'll set up this automation where at month five, you get this nice handwritten note from the founder that says, you know, hey, Jeremy, thanks so much for being part of our community and one of our best members. Here's, you know, 15% off for your next three months just because you're awesome and you've been with us for a bit and I just want to extend this to you. And one, because it's a handwritten note, it comes across as more authentic. Two, it gets opened uh, when you send it to them. So they actually put eyeballs on it. Uh, And three, it has a much higher conversion rate. And so, it, you know, by simply setting up something like that, you can instantly extend someone over to the point where they would have churned which obviously means they stick with you longer. They're going to, you know, more brand recall. You're, you're going to have to make more revenue off of them. Their customer lifetime value is going to go up. All, all good things across the board. You know, I just want to reiterate that, um, all right, because that's golden, what you just <laughs> said, because knowing your churn point and then being proactive on your churn point. And um, so if anyone is a software service and they know their churn point, it's something you could implement before the churn point to experiment with. Like it's all a test, right? So totally. what do you offer? Obviously sending that is a first step, but then what do you offer to help extend and add value to that that customer? So um, I love that thinking of it as a, a churn point and then being proactive on that. Um, exactly. Talk about um, bootstrapping versus raising money. Yeah. <laughs> um... I kind of have experience in both, right? So my previous company, we raised money, right? So we went the VC route from from day one, uh, yeah. and it's been a very different experience. I purposely yeah. didn't go that route with Ignite Post when and I that's started with Coach Ignite Up. Post. With Coach Up, yes. Yep. Um, and so it just kind of puts you on two different paths, right? When you raise money, so again, you start with what's your ultimate goal with the business? How do you want to build the business? I think it's super important uh, in both cases. You know, previously with Coach Up, I sat down with my co-founder initially, and we made the decision from the get-go that we wanted to to raise money and go the the venture out. And then with Ignite Post, I did the same thing. I sat down and I said, I don't want to go that mm-hmm. route. 
Um, but it's just interesting. Talk it's just about different. the differences. <clears throat> yeah, because yeah, Coach yeah. Up, I think you raised over fifteen million dollars for Correct, that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> versus this, you made the decision not to. Yeah, Why? and it just it makes different it makes different priorities important for you, right? So when you take money, everything is about growth, right? So it's all about uh, how do we go out and capture the market as quickly as possible and show trajectories and growth. So when you take money, everything is about kind of getting you to your next round of financing. So whether that's seed, it's like, okay, I've taken my seed. How do I get to my series A? How do I get to my series B? And it really focuses you basically on the metrics that allow you to go from one stage to the other, which may not necessarily always be the best metrics for the business. And, it, you know, there are a lot of times building coach up where, you know, looking back, we could kind of see that where if we weren't on this path where basically we needed to optimize the specific metrics in order to get us to the next round, we probably would have made some different de decisions and done things a little bit differently, right? Kind of having the luxury of saying, listen, this might not be the best thing long-term. Let's slow down a little bit and kind of take the longer term approach for this and, you know, grow according to the market instead of trying to, you know, kind of force it or try to grow artificially quick, which is, I think, what a lot of founders fall into when they go the VC route. So with Ignite Post, I wanted to do the exact opposite. I really wanted to build a company that would allow me to kind of make those jumps and kind of change the traje trajectory uh, as needed and kind of build it in a more, like, I guess, sustainable Organic fashion. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so it kind of gave me that freedom to talk with the market a little bit more and kind of understand, you know, what, what we're doing, where our value prop lies, and then change things if need be. And then also be okay with, you know, switching up how we want to offer the service and how we want to talk about the service uh, and how we want to package it. So um, there's kind of just both ways can work depending on, you know, what your goals are, but important to decide from from the start. Did you have to raise money for it um, from angels or friends or family, or did you self-fund Ignite Post? For, for Ignite Post, we definitely raised some uh, friends, family, and fools money uh, just to kind and of- What was the last one? <laughs> and fools, friends, <laughs> family, and fools. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, we definitely raised a little bit of that just to kind of help with the capital costs because there are actual you know, physical hardware exactly. capital costs. So we did that, but- uh, you know, I was very adamant on growing sustainably. So, you know, after that initial capital infusion, uh, we really customer funded. So that was the whole idea is we wanted to grow this business by having customers, not by going out and putting ourselves into more debt or, you know, taking out more, you know, massive loans or anything like that. So those are things that are available to us and, you know, we can kind of leverage them as need be, but we didn't want to make that the way the company grew. Yeah. I want to talk about how you got some of your first customers. Um, it's funny because when you say the bootstrap versus raising money, I always think of, I don't know if you've seen Silicon Valley, the oh, yeah. show, but I think of those scenes <laughs> from Silicon Valley of when they're raising money. Um, so oh, yeah. It's it's hilarious. If you haven't seen that it's show, not too far, it's it not too far off from reality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but how'd you get your first customers? So you invest a lot of time, energy, money. How do you get those first customers? Yeah, so it's all doing things that don't scale. So first of all, we use our own product a lot. And we still I was going to say, right? Yeah, you probably sent handwritten notes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, and so surprisingly, if you actually put the put the product in someone's hand uh, and they see that it works on them firsthand, it's a lot easier to ha have that conversation. So we still do this a lot. That this is kind of one of our our best ways that we still currently grow is just by using our own product and putting it in people's hands. But especially early on. Uh, I was not bashful about hopping on a call with anybody that would just, you know, want to talk with me and also just showing up in person. You know, I, I did a lot of customer discovery, uh, mostly via either video calls like this, where I actually would just talk with people and, you know, physically like hold things up and show them, you know, what the notes look like and, you know, open them and kind of show them, show them everything. So that was super important. You know, again, I knew it maybe wasn't going to scale going forward. Um, but it gave me a lot of information and insight as to how to speak to different industries because the industries that we go after uh, have different use cases and different pain points. So it gave me the ability to know what are those pain points, how to speak to them, and kind of how to talk their language. And then that kind of influenced 
what we, how we talked about our service. And so if you go to our site and kind of, you know, you're scrolling through the site before, if you go to the different industries and the different segments, you'll see that purposely we talk about the service in a different way, talk about different use cases, because different things are going to be import, di- important based on what industry you're in. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious, initially, what industries did you decide? Because I could see so many use cases for this. There's, there's unlimited use cases for this. That was a challenge. Um, I mean, you could have, I mean, so many things from the wedding industry to even coach up and professional athletes and fan clubs. And so where did you start? Yeah. How did you decide to start on um, an industry? Yeah. So that's a good question. So when we initially started the business, actually, we were actually going, uh, working with a lot of sales teams. And this was actually prior to the pandemic. Uh, and it's funny because if you were, you know, if we were having this conversation pre-pandemic, it would be way different than post-pandemic. Yeah. Talk and about can, pre versus I, I, post. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll dive in and, and chat about that. So uh, pre, we were working with a lot of sales teams and basically they were using us for a bunch of the reasons that we ch- chatted about earlier, right? Prospecting, getting my foot in the door, storing deals along. And then when everybody started working remotely uh, and every, nobody was at the office anymore, we saw a lot of those deals evaporate. Uh, a lot of the the companies didn't like basically like stopped working with us because they said, listen, I have no idea where my prospects are anymore. We used to be able to just reach out to them at the office. They're not at the office anymore. So what we had to do is we had to figure out, okay, if we need to pivot, where where are our people? Like where can we go to that, you know, this is not an issue. And so that's actually one of the big reasons why we shifted to uh, working with a lot of e-commerce brands. Because certainly during the pandemic, that was what everybody was doing. They right? already have everybody the addresses too. Online, and that it's a solved problem. So that's really kind of what pivoted us and focused us there. But to your point, the challenge was actually figuring out what we don't want to do. Because like you like you said, almost any business that has a customer and wants to develop a relationship with the customer could use our service in some way, shape, or form. So that was that was kind of step one, figuring out, you know, what the good uh, what a good market to target was. And then two, you know, to also to your point, one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that we aligned the value that we were providing um, with Ignite Post with the value that the business itself was going to see out of using our service. So when you talk about things like, you know, weddings and invitations and things like that, uh, that is a great use case for us. But also what we realized is essentially someone's only going to value our service as much as, you know, their time to sit down and like write the card out. Whereas when we talk about some of these other industries like nonprofits or e-commerce brands or sales, you know, the value of our service is going to be the value that we can bring to them. So the example that we talked about before, if we can, you know, set up a nice flow for an e-commerce brand and it results in, you know, 30% of their customers staying in a subscription that much longer, that's worth a lot more than, you know, somebody that's just valuing us as like, okay, this is going to just save me some time writing out a few, you know, wedding invitations or wedding thank you notes or something. So we use that to shape uh, who we go after a lot too, as to what kind of value are we really delivering for the the customer? Yeah, and there's a nonprofit, so I imagine it could be to the people donating, but also, you know, big donors. Um, people use it for big donors as well. Totally, yeah. And actually, for nonprofits, it's very interesting because everybody always thinks of our solution as, oh, this would be great for your like the big VIP donors. And actually, in reality, it's kind of the middle segment that has the most value because the top 1% of donors typically, you know, if I'm a stewardship officer, I have, I'm on a, I'm on a first name basis with those folks, right? I'm maybe taking them out to lunch or dinner or maybe sending them some wine or something. So you, you're already giving them a lot of attention, but the middle segment, right? And I can use myself as a great example. I went to BU, I donate, you know, 500 bucks or so every year to the, to the school. Uh, and to me, that's like, a lot of money. That's like a decent sized donation. I never get any handwritten thank you cards or anything from them. Like, and so B, if you're people, listening, you yeah, should be using know. ignitepost.com. You know? Yeah. So, um, but like, that's a great example, right? They're so neglected. That middle segment. Exactly. Yeah. So people that donate, you know, like me, $500 up to like $5,000 uh, are probably in that same bucket where they don't really get the individual attention, but that's a lot of money. And like the whole idea is, how do we steward this fo- these group of folks up the spectrum so that maybe someday 
they become that you know one one percent of of donors. But at the very least, how do we make sure that they we show their appreciation so that they continue to come back year after year? So that's where we actually see the most activity in the nonprofit space is in that kind of middle section. Mm. Do you find that you know obviously people send cold outreach <clears throat> via social media, LinkedIn, cold email? Are people using it for cold mail? Are they using it just to reach out to cold people they don't know? And I'm curious if so. Are there certain databases they're using? Like, are they going on Zoom info and then collecting and you know addresses? Because it's different, a little different from an email. Like you said, those salespeople, like I don't even know where these people live. So, are people using it for cold mail? And then how are they? uh, What are some other tools are using it to use Ignite Post? Yes, so they are using it for cold mail, uh, but the way they do it is a little bit unique. So unlike direct mail, we generally don't don't um, subscribe to the the kind of spray and pray methodology. Where a lot of like the, the every door direct mail, right? Where you can say, okay, I'm going to pepper everybody in this particular area code um, with my my mail. So we typically don't subscribe to recommending that. We recommend you know being a little bit more targeted than just kind of this the spray and pray. So the kind of folks that we do work with, you know, we work with a lot of, you know, home service providers, we work with a lot of like moving companies and things like that, that uh, they want to target cold, like people cold, but they do it in a more strategic way. So using that as an example. So instead of just saying, I'm just going to pepper, you know, this entire, my entire, you know, service area with direct mail, what they'll do is they'll actually look for databases, um, either from the MLS or some other services that indicate, you know, if I'm a moving company, okay, I, I will look for when homes go under agreement, right? Because when homes go under agreement, that's public, you know, knowledge. And I know, okay, if you just sold your home, what are you probably going to need? You're probably going to need help moving. So that's kind of a good indication. And then what they'll do is they will zero in and target those folks in their service area who have uh, recently had their homes go under agreement and specifically reach out in a more personalized way, right, with our with our handwritten notes to those specific homes, instead of just, you know, peppering the, the entire neighborhood. So we do see that that that's kind of a little bit more strategic, and that works really well. Uh, but again, it's using that very targeted approach. Let's talk Steph Curry for a second. <laughs> okay, how did that come about? Yeah. So. What I realized, so one of the interesting things when you work with athletes or work with celebrity athletes in general, uh, a lot of people don't realize that it actually is more important the relationship you have kind of behind the scenes with their agent or whoever you're going to be interfacing with. And so uh, we got connected to, I believe it was Octagon that was their, uh, his agency that was represented. Don't quote me on that. I got to go and look it up. But um, we got connected uh, through there. And one of the things that, like I said, people don't realize is a lot of times athletes, they're not the actual ones doing all of the work and all the promotions and everything. So if you see, you know, these celebrity athletes, you know, doing all these promotions and everything, really behind the scenes, what's happening is there's kind of a whole strategy. And at this point, kind of a strategy team. And so that's the that's the key is figuring out, you know, who are, who are the people behind the scenes that are responsible for endorsements and deals and how do we get connected to them? So that was kind of the the path that we took. Um, I, I, to this day, still have never met Steph Curry. Um, I love him. Great guy. But I personally have never met him. Um, but we interfaced with uh, his agent a lot because that's who you're going to be talking to. And if you are pursuing just as kind of a you know general piece of advice, if any businesses out there are pursuing some type of celebrity endorsement like that, Make sure that you have a very good relationship with whoever the person is behind the scenes who is actually going to be doing the things that you need them to do. That's a much more critical relationship to have than with the actual athlete themselves or celebrity, well, whoever. All right, I want to talk about so the choice to have a spokesperson versus not, and then why you went Steph Curry. I mean, there's a lot of athletes out there, but yeah. why the decision? to have one versus not. And, and um, I'm not sure if you have, are going to have an Ignite post. Who would be an Ignite post <laughs> spokesperson? I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. know. There's no plans currently to have an Ignite post for, spokesperson. I'll have to brainstorm but, about that. <laughs> but uh, the thought behind having Steph Curry for Coach Up uh, was actually multidimensional. So number one, basketball was our best sport. It was a, by far. And so we knew we wanted to have somebody uh, in basketball. Uh, 
Number two, when it, when actually when we reached out and started talking to uh, to his folks, you know, people knew who Steph Curry was, but he wasn't this you know two time and you know maybe it's like even more now NBA MVP and like now he's a household name. He was becoming that, and we thought that he would get there, but he wasn't quite there. So we knew that he was kind of on the upward trajectory. Um, so those are two things, and then the last thing is it fit in with the mission of our business, right? At Coach up. The whole idea was that, you know, people be you you achieve your potential by working hard at it, and that not everybody, almost no one actually, is born with just natural talent. And he was a great example of that, right? Unlike someone like LeBron James, right, that everybody looks at and they're like, well, he just has a lot of just raw talent. You know, he, he was just born like that. Steph Curry. You is wanted not like someone that. like smaller who people can relate maybe to, but is really a household name and, and good. Yeah, and had the whole story because his whole story is, you know, he really had to had to work for what he got. He really trained a lot, and that's how he got so good. He didn't, if you look at him, and he'll be the first to tell you, he doesn't have just raw talent and raw ability. He had to cultivate that and work very hard and train to get it. And so that story is really the story that we wanted to, you know, position. And that's why we thought he was a good spokesman for Coach Up. And so if you were to have a Ignite post, uh, spokesperson what type of and i, I want to point out there's there's a really interesting episode i did with roy krebs of natural stacks and he talked about this very thing where they um <clears throat> had people who sent in success stories one of them was uh in the world series of poker and so they ended up um striking a deal with with this person and it's an incredible story i think um <clears throat> it's my favorite intro because you'll see if you ever watch the roy krebs um you know, it's the, the intro is from what happened in the World Series of Poker. I won't even give it away because it's so <laughs> exciting. But um, he, he talk, walks through how they went about getting a, a spokesperson, essentially. So I'm just curious, with Ignite Post, what would you look for in a, in a spokesperson? Yeah. So I think I would go with somebody that was very into... Uh, relationships right and like relationship marketing and kind of like pulling out folks stories right because that's at the end of the day as humans that's what we remember we remember stories mm. uh and we remember that that's that's what gets us to you know imprint things on our on our brain uh and i think that that gets lost a little bit in this kind of sea of, of digital noise and that's the whole thesis behind ignite post is how do we enable brands and kind of inject this you know personality this kind of relationship centric era as we like to say how do we kind of stored it in. So I would say it would be somebody in that kind of storytelling, more relationship building, relationship deepening kind of space. Hmm. Like Oprah, someone like that. <laughs> Oprah would be great. I would, <laughs> I would love Oprah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have one last question. Um, all right. First of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing the story. Um, I want to just encourage people to check out ignitepost.com to learn more. Um, my last question is more just resources. Um, you know, you're always learning um, and, you know, entrepreneur and um, just have done so much, um, whether it's mentors or books, what are some resources or mentors that are have been important to you? Yeah, well, so on the book side, um, the, the one book that I always recommend everybody read if they're thinking about starting a business is The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yeah, um, and Michael on the podcast. He's great. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Um, so that's one of my favorites. I re read it a while ago and every now and then I'll kind of go back and like either listen to the audio book or just kind of skim it again. Just kind of thinking about how to, you know, build a business and systemize it so that it kind of operates without you. So um, that, that's one. And then I also like The Lean Startup. Uh, that kind of seems like it took a lot of the actual concepts um, from Emith and just kind of like put a different spin on it and kind of restructured it a little bit. Eric so, Reese, yeah. Yep, yep. So those those are two that I recommend. On the mentor side, actually, I'm a big proponent of uh, having a advisory council that you can lean on. So, you know, for me, I have uh, an advisory council that I've built that I talk with on a regular basis. Um, you know, my, my CEO coach, uh, Steve Rubin, I talk with him probably once a week and then uh, my other advisors on an as needed basis, probably monthly. And then we do kind of quarterly, you know, check-ins, board meetings, things like that. So, but having just other people 
that know a lot more about you in specific areas that are critical to your business, super important. So that's kind of what I did is I've got folks that are, you know, very, very well educated in, you know, operations, in marketing, in sales, and kind of can lean on them as needed. Uh, so I think that's super important just to have somebody that, you know, if you pick up the phone and you reach out to them, they're going to answer and kind of talk you through and they know more about you in those domains. Yeah. So coaches for all those specialties, whatever they mean, whether it's be for the CEO piece, for the operations piece, the marketing piece, the sales piece. I love it. You know, Arian, thank you. Everyone check out ignitepost.com and learn more, uh, check out more episodes of the podcast. So thanks you. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.